go ahead and get started here. Hello and welcome to our discussion on process automation in banking. This is a hugely important topic and it holds a lot of weight for FinServe right now. I think through the information that we're going to go over today, you will see why. If any questions come up during the presentation, you're welcome to pop them into the chat. Um, of course, you can always email us later with anything you think of after the fact, um, and we're happy to get those inquiries answered for you. Uh, the event is being recorded, and so we'll make sure that you get any relevant assets necessary after the webinar. With that, let's get started. All right, so before we dive in here, you probably want to know who is talking to you today. Um, so here are some quick highlights about us. We are Technology Advisors, Inc. We're a digital transformation company out of Chicago, and we've been doing this for about 32 years now. Um, our main approach is strategic software selection. And what that means is basically, we're not here to just throw a software solution at you and hope for the best. Um, the way that we go about helping our clients acquire software is very thoughtful. We look at not only the goals you're trying to accomplish, but um, the existing software that you have and how that might tie in with the software, um, the, the budget you have. And we try to align the solution that you choose to the specific use cases you're trying to accomplish. Sometimes the client knows those specific use cases. Sometimes they're a little bit more general and they say, oh, you know, we want to be more productive and uh, we want to be, we want to innovate faster. What we do is help you get more granular about exactly what that means so that we can find a solution that has the features that match your needs. We're also expert integrators. We've been doing that for over a decade. We use our proprietary iPaaS solution, which is an integration platform as a service. Um, what that means is uh, an, an iPaaS can connect anything to anything. So um, it's really a dynamic way to connect systems. And then this is the thing that I really wanted to point out the most about us um, is our full SOC 2 compliance by the end of the year. Uh, some of you may be familiar with SOC 2 compliance. For those of you who are not, um, it's just a voluntary compliance standard for service organizations. Um, the American Institute of CPAs uh, put this together and essentially it specifies how organizations should manage their customer data. Um, it puts forth standards based on this trust services criteria that they have. So that's around data security, data availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. Um, so the good news is we were already doing pretty much all of this, but you know, just by having that third party come in and put their stamp of approval on it, we just thought that was something that was really important for our financial services customers um, to give them additional peace of mind in how we're handling their data. And then we also do custom software development. So, you know, you might find a solution that ticks 99 out of 100 of the boxes that you want to tick. Um, but maybe there's one field or one function uh, that you just really would be a nice to have. Uh, that's where, you know, our custom development team can come in and, and make those changes for you. All right, so let's do some intros. My name is Deneen Madura. I'm the Marketing and Content Director here at Technology Advisors. And a big part of my job is getting to the bottom of trends and challenges that are affecting our customer base. Um, so not only we can create content that's useful to them, but also so that when we are helping uh, research the solutions that are the best fit for them, we're coming into that with an educated background on their industry and the trends that are affecting what they do. So that's part of the information that I'm gonna be presenting to you today. Uh, then we have Megan Sheehan, our Director of Project Management, who's going to be showing the process automation demo later in the presentation. Um, Megan is a math whiz and a process management genius, if I do say so. Um, she really has this incredible ability to translate complex ideas into standardized processes for our customers. And she's applied that in many ways uh, for quite a few years. So there's really no one better to take us through the process automation demo than Megan. And then 
our silent observer today is our CEO, Sam Biardo, uh, our founder as well. Um, he's standing by and listening in, and um, he's going to be following up after the conversation um, just to find out if anybody has additional questions. He's very knowledgeable uh, in terms of all of this uh, topic matter, so uh, he can provide some additional insights if need be. All right, so what exactly are we going to talk about today? Well, a couple of things. First, we're going to look at some of the biggest forces at play for banking and FinServe. And part of that are technology challenges and opportunities, but also trends in the industry and the market itself. Then we're going to look at how the tech trends of today are helping banks to compete on these forces and how that all ties in with this process automation conversation that we're having. And then at the end of the presentation, we're going to discuss process automation in action and show you what that might look like. So let's start by taking a look at some of the market factors and trends that are influencing banking and FinServe right now. Apologies, I tried to get this not blurry through every variation possible, but it just wasn't happening. So uh, you can still get the general gist, but um, According to a Deloitte report in 2018, the digital banking landscape was already increasing prior to the pandemic. Globally, banks were planning to invest over $9.7 billion to enhance their digital banking capabilities, and that's just in the front office. Now, then you get this two-year shutdown, and boom, you intensify that digital banking adoption. So now there's not just a demand for rapid digitization, but there's really this need for it. And so this graph is from BCG Retail's Banking Pulse, and it shows just how much that demand accelerated in 2020 alone. We see a 30% increase in mobile app usage and a 23% increase in online banking. And then if you look to the right, the predictions for its uses post-pandemic not quite as high, but still pretty strong. So this push for faster digitalization is really rippling through the entire FinServe ecosystem right now. Let's take a look at some other stats around this digitization push. Uh, a delayed survey in 2021 showed the effects with how FinServe executives viewed their digital assets. 45% of them believe that custody of digital assets will play an important role in their organizations. And here's a fun fact that supports that. Digital is now the top channel for U.S. borrowers to purchase home loans. I mean, that, and the home loan market is booming right now. So that's tying into what these executives were expecting. Um, in, in last year, BDO in July, uh, they pulled 100 C-suite executives at mid-market banks, credit unions, and other lending institutions. And what they found was that most organizations have developed digital transformation strategies, and nearly half are also accelerating those existing plans. So in addition to this digitization, there's also been workforce upheavals. We've all heard that term, the great resignation at this point. Unfortunately, FinServe and banking is not immune. Um, the financial services industry has suffered from labor, labor shortages that are caused not only by the pandemic dislocation, but also by some industry-wide trends. And we'll kind of dive into those trends a little bit more in the next slide, but just as a preview, you've got younger veterans leaving their jobs to branch out on their own. You've got these disenchanted junior executives who are gravitating towards this exciting world of fintech. And then you've got a booming sector that is compelling companies to outsource non-core functions to fintech. So overall in the US job market, there were 10.4 million job openings in August, but 4.3 million people at the same time quit their jobs. So that number declined in October of last year, um, but hiring still dropped significantly. The financial services and insurance industries, as you can see by this number, um, they represent 96,000 of those payroll drops. So what are the reasons behind these workforce upheavals? Well, a couple of things. There's a general dissatisfaction with work-life balance, 
Um, in a recent Goldman Sachs survey, they got a, a scary result. Uh, most of their first year analysts were characterizing work conditions as inhumane, 100 hour work weeks, sleep deprivation, abuse from senior colleagues. So when you're working 100 hours a week, there's not really a lot of time to balance your personal life with, with that type of demanding uh, job approach. Then you've also got this attraction to fintech that we talked about. And bankers are turning to fintech for the same reason that consumers do. They're both fed up with how this legacy banking system operates. Um, the fintech sector is pushing this really consumer-centric, innovation-first philosophy, and it's really attractive to junior industry executives. Um, moreover, fintech growth across services like banking and lending, that's adding a lot of job opportunities. And industry faith in fintech has grown such that investments in the sector hit $21 billion last year. So you've got a dissatisfaction with work-life balance. You've got more younger talent gravitating towards this fintech world. And then during the pandemic, you had non-customer facing banking employees that started to work from home and realized, hey, you know what? This is fine. I don't need to commute to the office every day to do my job. But meanwhile, the ones who had to stay in the office had to deal with that pandemic thing, and it affected them. 37% of financial services employees felt that the pandemic had a negative impact on their mental health. 13% said it had a negative impact on their physical health. And 22% felt that it really took a toll on their workload as well. At the same time, this is a pivotal moment for FinServe to carve its place in society. And there's a couple opportunities here that FinServe can be taking advantage of and is taking advantage of. First of all, we have the environmental and climate approach with ESG initiatives. That's environmental, social, and governance strategies. So things like negative screening, where you exclude or avoid transactions that aren't aligned with environmental, social, or ethical standards, or positive screening, where you're selecting corporate borrowers that score high on ESG factors, integrating corporate ESG issues into financing decisions, and then thematic investing, which is prioritizing the companies and projects that are aimed at positive social change, be that climate or gender equality, for example. There's also uh, an underserved market, and, and there are several underserved markets that we could talk about, but the one that I thought was most relevant to this particular moment was gig workers. So it's estimated that 25% of the U.S. workforce is involved in the gig economy, and actually some experts are estimating that even higher, closer to 35% uh, post-pandemic. Gig workers are underbanked, they don't have access to the resources to grow their financial wellness. And that's because they're earning these erratic incomes and it's making it really a lot harder for them to qualify for consumer loans and mortgages. Uh, they really lack a lot of the protections and benefits that other workers are able to enjoy. But this demographic isn't going away. And so this is a moment for FinServe to meet the needs of this demographic and start thinking of creative ways um, to engage them. We also have these niche financial institutions. So there's this hyper-personalization emerging with financial, financial, excuse me, financial institutions like Daylight, which caters to LGBT customers. So there's an opportunity to really micro-segment uh, for FinServe. And then you have unmet demands among aspiring affluent consumer demographics. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine the other day about just this exact thing. Uh, her and her husband have saved up a little bit of money. Uh, they're not rich by any means, but you know, they, it's a little chunk and they want to be able to do something with it. Um, but what they're finding in their research is, yeah, we have a little bit, but we don't actually have enough to work with a traditional advisor. And so they kind of feel like they're in a bit of a limbo right now. I want to address my financial needs, but I don't know how to do that because I don't have 
the level of wealth that is required for some of the things that I want to do. And so there's all these opportunities right now for FinServe to take a look at some of these options and carve their place in society and make an impact there. Of course, every industry, especially right now, uh, we need to consider cyber risks. I think the White House just did a press briefing yesterday about you know, how they've been warned specific companies about potential um, you know, hacking and uh, data breaches by Russia. So uh, unfortunately, FinServe is not immune to cyber risk. There's unencrypted data, there's malware on end user devices. If you're employing a third party vendor to develop services for you and they don't have solid cybersecurity policies, you got another issue. And then there's this whole idea of spoofing as well, where hackers are impersonating a bank website's URL to steal their login info. On top of that, you've got competition from big tech. In a recent survey, more than 40% of US digital banking users said they would trust PayPal to provide them with banking services. And analysts are seeing that as a signal that big tech is going to continue to push into banking. And as they do, they're really gonna become an even more viable competitor for banks. And then of course, the impact of crypto, which honestly crypto could be its own webinar, but you know, at a high level, traditional banks are hesitant to adopt the use of crypto, understandably, they believe there is an inherent risk there that outweighs the benefits. It's a very decentralized nature of currency. And the way that it's viewed is that it undermines the authority of central banks, leaving some to believe not only will they not be needed anymore, but they're going to be unable to control the money supply. In addition to that, the price of cryptocurrencies, if you look at even Bitcoin specifically on this example, they've generally been volatile over their short life. However, banks can and should embrace this technology to stay competitive, and many of the big names already are. Uh, JP Morgan has taken on two cryptocurrency exchanges, Coinbase and Gemini, as banking customers. Uh, Fidelity Digital Assets is creating a crypto fund, and PayPal is now accepting cryptocurrency transactions. So the good news here is that banks can actually play a significant role in the crypto industry, and hopefully by doing that, they will add some much-needed assurance and security to this largely unregulated environment. And then last but not least, we've got the elephant in the room neobanks. So challenger banks are feeding on low satisfaction with mainstream banks. They are leading in customer satisfaction with 83% satisfied customers in the US and 76% satisfied customers in the UK. Now this graphic here is showing the feelings of US banking consumers on traditional banking and FinServe outlets. And we are seeing with those traditional ones, they are most satisfied with credit unions and least satisfied with the top 50 global banks. Mm, you know, that might not, that might not be a, a good situation to be in. But the question is why? Why are neobanks pulling ahead at the rate that they are? There's a couple of factors that we need to think about with that. First of all, they have a really strong cost efficiency and innovation structure. Uh, a recent Oliver Wyman study found that traditional banks are taking about three to six months to launch a new feature, while these challenger banks are doing the same thing in a couple of weeks. Their cost of acquisition is also lower, around $1 to $38, compared to $200 for a traditional bank. So Monzo in the UK is a great example of this. They spend under $9 per customer on customer acquisition of a primary account. And then the cost efficiency ratio isn't quite as stark, but it's still notable. Um, you know, their cost efficiency ratio is 46% compared to 50 to 60 for most traditional banks. So they're super focused on cost efficiency super focused on quick innovations and quick feature launches. And then tied in with that, 
there's this focus on the digital customer experience and simplifying of processes. So location agnostic banks are collaborating now because they're seeing an opportunity. So they're looking at local and global banks and fintechs, and they're thinking about ways that they can expand their cross-sell and rebundle services through tight-knit integrations with those types of companies. Here's one example, Allior, Solaris, and Raisin, Raisin's backed by PayPal. They joined forces with MasterCard in 2018 in Europe, and they rolled out an open banking platform based on APIs. Uh, that is key. A the API conversation is going to come up here again later, so keep that in mind. And what that did was it automated accounting and cash flows for SMBs and freelancers. Then there's Counting Up, which was a UK-based neobank, did the same type of approach. They, they partnered with a local bank and they enabled instant automated expense recording for small businesses with real-time insights into the health of, of the business. So they are capitalizing on this digital convenience opportunity. And then there's this banking as a service model. And here's that API conversation coming into play again creating open banking through API connections, using mobile only to the greatest advantage, which has super low customer acquisition costs, not depending so much on third-party development or FinTech to get their innovations done, and real-time data integration and management that is not only helping on their end, but is signaling to the consumer that uh, there's a level of convenience and simplification there uh, that they can enjoy. And they're also doing this open ecosystem approach to allow access to external developers. So you've got that low cost structure and you've got that simplified user experience, giving neobanks the ability to offer these faster and more transparent models. But here's another chart from Finnovate Research that is showing just that. And what I particularly want to focus on here is the user experience with feature-rich apps and tools. So remember on that last slide, we saw neobanks can launch a new feature in a couple weeks instead of the months that it might take a traditional organization. So delivering on these quality user experiences is happening a lot quicker and it's easier for them to accomplish. Overall, what we can see from this data is they are outperforming mainstream banks in the minds of consumers in nearly every function. But this user experience and this low cost structure are two of the most stark differentiations between the two. So some of those things that we discussed are obstacles. Some, however, are opportunities. In general though, what are the tech trends that are helping banks to compete in this evolving marketplace? Well, overall, the concept of digital transformation, right? So that's mobile, online chatbots. Uh, the deployment of chatbots alone is going to save the banking industry over $7.3 billion by next year. We did mention fintech partnerships earlier, which can be beneficial, but there's a caveat there. So banks are partnering with fintech and other non-banks to help them innovate but it's costing them quite a bit. Uh, Forrester is estimating double digit growth in bank tech spending this year. And there's a particular bump in FinTech investments. So they're trying to adapt, but traditional organizations still have this fear in the back of their minds about what this boom in FinTechs is going to mean for them. More than three quarters of banks are fearing the financial industry growth rate is gonna cost them customers and about half of them have expressed high levels of fear of fintech companies like Apple Pay and Stripe. Now, from the fintech perspe perspective, it's not all bright and rosy either. 50% of fintech executives don't feel they found the right collaborative partnerships with these traditional banks either. And that's according to payments, cards, and mobile data. With that said, one reason for this low level of cooperation may have to do with low agility on the bank's part. So apparently, only 21% of traditional banks have the agile capabilities to successfully work with fintech companies. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about that concept of agility on the next slide, but just keep that in mind as we move forward. Then you've got this concept of AI and blockchain. So uh, traditional banking is adopting AI for robo-advisors. And by the end of this year, robo-advisors are going to manage $2 trillion in assets. Then you've got blockchain, which is allowing data to be stored globally across thousands of servers and totally revolutionizing how central banks and financial markets are operating right now. However, central banks and financial markets are not the only ones trying to benefit from blockchain. We bring that fintech conversation back into the picture and we see that fintech is, uh, when it comes to blockchain and regulatory technology, those are two of the fastest growing segments for that industry. So it's fantastic that traditional organizations are adopting blockchain, but they gotta keep in mind, so is FinTech and they're using it in different ways. All right, here's our conversation about APIs again. So the basic gist of, of this conversation is the following, legacy systems, outdated types of programs that do not integrate well with modern applications are slowing down this digital transformation effort that traditional organizations are trying to adopt right now. And that is part of the problem. But the other part of the problem is that they're sucking up all of the budgets as well without integration capacity through APIs, it's costing traditional banks 60 to 80% of their total budget on operations and maintenance alone of their software systems. That is a huge, horrifying chunk. Then we've got low code, no code. And so we'll, we'll define this a little bit more and flesh this out in a little bit later, but the basic gist of low code and no code is that you are enabling faster innovation and more modern user experiences and scaled application development without forcing teams to rely on dev apps, without forcing teams to rely on fintech, without forcing teams to rely on IT so heavily. Because what low code and no code is all about is accomplishing those things with a visual interface that doesn't require coding knowledge, that doesn't require, you know, writing out and scripting data. So they can have regular users building these innovative user experiences for clients without that heavy DevOps layer. And it's showing real benefits for the banks that are adopting it. And I'll, I'll explain some uh, examples later on. But here's some stats to get us started. It's reducing time to market 40 to 60% for rapid application development. And it's reducing the cost of change by up to 35% when working across siloed ap applications. Then we've got the concept of agility coming back into play here. So banks with agile cultures are introducing new products and services faster. They're quicker at identifying and making cost reductions. Their customer ratings are improving. The impact is eye-opening. Um, for example, there's a leading U.S. mortgage provider, and they reduced the time it took to roll out new product features by as much as 75% by adopting Agile practices. So they went from three to six months to roll out a new product feature to six to eight weeks. In conjunction with that, they found that the percentage of customers who were using the new features jumped from 50 to 87%. And not surprisingly, probably, their JD Power customer survey ratings rose as well. Uh, underneath the agility bullet point here, there's a couple more stats to back that up. But um, I think one of the most powerful is this first one that a large global bank deployed a digital channel with mobile first experience and they cut the cost of customer research by 94% with agile approaches. So that is significant. 
So how does all of this that we've talked about, these, these evolutions in the market, these tech trends, how does this all tie into the conversation of no-code process automation? Well, let's get some shared definitions first. So what is a no-code platform? It is a tool that makes it possible for citizen developers to create apps and workflows through a visual drag and drop environment. And if, you've, if you're unfamiliar with the term citizen developers, it just means business users who do not have technical or coding skills. Uh, there's every major software developer right now is moving towards this model, guys. Um, and that's because it has consistency and uniformity, and it is freeing up clients to not have to rely on developers to automate. Um, Microsoft and Google are developing their own low-code and no-code tools right now, um, and every major vendor is looking at doing this. Um, 2020, with you know, not only a shortage of developers, but all workers in general, really saw the push for these types of systems to skyrocket. Okay, so no code we would define and process automation. Process automation is when you use technology to automate complex business processes and create these digitally enabled workflows. And there's a couple of benefits that come out of that. You're decreasing errors because you're building repeatable processes that your internal teams are following. You're increasing the speed of delivery. Um, there's a uniform process, it's faster, it's more efficient, it's less manual, and your teams are able to output new features, new apps, new experiences on digital faster. You're cutting down the costs, which we talked about earlier, because you're not relying so heavily on FinTech, you're not relying so heavily on a huge DevOps team, and the automation is removing the manual roadblocks, and you're simplifying processes overall. One thing that doesn't mention here is that it also standardizes processes, and that can help with building an overall more consistent customer experience across the digital environment. So there are a lot of benefits to no-code process automation. I will just hit on what I think are the four biggest uh, and strongest arguments for this. Um, first of all, the ability to democratize innovation. Almost 80% of banking CEOs in a PwC survey saw digital skill shortfalls as a key challenge to their digital transformation. When you democratize that innovation, when you make that innovation available to more users within your organization, you fill that gap. Citizen developers are likely to outnumber IT professionals four times by next year. And those regular employees are the ones that are going to be given closer control of these programs. And they're going to be the ones adding functionality that supports corporate change or building new components to support requirements of an application. Now, I would like to note, this is not a free for all and it's not uh, an elimination of the role of IT and DevOps. This is all happening under close supervision of IT and DevOps. Citizen developers are prototyping and testing all of this in what's called sandbox environments before they're just throwing it out to the masses, first of all. And second of all, IT and DevOps teams are now, instead of having to spend hours and hours and hours trying to code and test and code and test, they are just overseeing and aiding these citizen developers in the build out of these applications and workflows based on you know, the best practices of the organization, based on data governance, and all the knowledge that DevOps and IT can bring to the table in terms of how this should be done in a best practices way. So it's not eliminating the need for them. Um, it's just evolving their role in the conversation. Then you've got improved banking services. So now you're able to build these no-code applications and enable digital accounts and digital loans with non-technical users in a couple of days. You're getting things to market faster, you're innovating sooner, and that's improving 
the experience for customers, and it's speeding up the rate at which these banking services are changed and updated. Less expensive innovation. So by deploying digital solutions through a no-code platform, IT is able to have that data governments overseeing and, and oversee the compliance, but they're still empowering the business people to develop the systems that they want. And there's a cost savings that carries over there to the operational costs as well. So your digital transformation is being achieved much quicker. It's removing the manual and paper-based processes that are inefficient. And now not only is IT kind of overseeing this bigger picture, but they're also able to focus on other projects that maybe they weren't having the time to get to before because of the time-consuming nature of the coding that they were doing in the past. So what would take a team of 20 high-skilled developers a month to accomplish can now be achieved with two developers using the right no-code tool. So not only are you enabling your citizen developers, but you're really empowering your IT team to do things quicker as well. And with less reliance on FinTech and less pressure on those internal IT teams. And then finally, here's that word agile again, enabling agile development. So according to Gardner, by 2024, low-code and no-code app platforms are going to be responsible for 65% of all application development activity. And that's going to enable all these existing teams to speed up application development and move away from these complicated legacy platforms that are not allowing them to have those you know, powerful API connections that help them digitize sooner. And so we're accelerating our agility and scalability that way. So what are some real world applications of these low and no code process automations? Well, let's take a look at a couple of quick examples and then I will soon turn over the floor to Megan here uh, to show us what this might look like in the real world. So the cooperative bank, they're a retail and commercial bank out of the UK. They wanted to improve the speed and accuracy of customer experience queries. And so they looked at all their processes and they chose 10 that they thought required a lot of manual intervention and decided to automate those. Some of those were things like uh, direct debit cancellation, account closures, foreign payments, and audit reports. They were able to automate all 10 of those within 12 months. And here were their results. Now, instead of it taking six to seven hours to manually do an audit, it takes one minute with the automation they built. The ROI on it basically paid for itself. Each individual project paid for itself in less than three months. And again, the processes were built by business users with no code. So it really reduced the overall IT costs. They're not outsourcing the FinTech at this point or building a huge IT team. RBC Wealth Management, they're out of Canada and the US. They wanted to open new accounts faster and just they had a huge backlog of IT projects um, that they wanted to cut down on. So one of the biggest things that they did was they digitized the opening of new accounts. So they took 24 minutes instead of several weeks of manual processes. And apparently 100 plus pages of paperwork, I don't know in what world any human should be doing that, but that sounds terrible. So bless them for doing that because that would not be a job uh, that I would like to have personally. Um, one of the other things I really liked that they did was they consolidated their information for their staff. So essentially, when somebody would have a client meeting, they would want to, you know, read up on the client first, get all the info on their data, um, but they would have to be jumping around to all these different systems. So what, what Wealth Management do, did was they took 26 different systems and pulled in all of the pertinent data to a single screen so that their staff could reference that before a client meeting instead of jumping around, losing their minds. 
And then two other quick examples, there was a major U.S. banking firm. They wanted to automate processes for loan applications, and they were able to cut down the decision-making process from 30 hours to 30 minutes. And that also helped them with their reporting and analytics uh, visibility as well. An international accounting firm used no code to set up quality assurance systems that were designating pending tasks automatically to their team. So basically it just helped employees say, okay, you know, let me prioritize which issues should be handled first. Um, and it, it informed those decisions. So what they did was they implemented workflows for one organization first. And then when they saw the success there, they implemented it worldwide, and now it's connected to a central database across all their applications. All right, so I'm gonna hand the floor over to Megan pretty soon here, but before I do, I just wanna take a moment to explain what we're gonna be looking at and why. So Megan is gonna show you a no-code process automation platform called Creatio and their value propositions on the screen here. It's a global vendor of one platform to automate industry workflows and CRM with no code and a maximum degree of freedom. So as you can see by the screenshot on the left, the interface is completely visual and drag and drop. And this example of a bank credit card promotion workflow highlights just how straightforward these types of processes are in a no code solution. So if you wanted to alter any of these elements, basically just clicking and dragging them around or deleting them. So why did we choose Creatio to show you today? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, they're an industry leader at this. I will not get into all their awards. It's crazy. You can go on their website. There's just too many. But essentially, you, you can see the biggest names here, Gardner, Forrester, Nucleus, um, Intelligent Business Process Automation, Low-Code anim Automation Platforms, um, other awards from independent firms on low-code value. Um, so they are at the forefront of this no code, low code process automation game. But the other factor that came into play here is that a lot of our own FinServe customers are using this right now to automate their workflows and seeing their success with the drag and drop features and functions. Um, it just made sense to us to build on that. And, you know, therefore we could provide even more robust experiences for our FinServe customers and our future clients. All right, I'm going to pass the floor over to Megan to demonstrate no code process automation for us. All right, thank you, Deneen. Um, so you guys should be seeing my screen now and I've got Creatio up and running here. Um, so we're going to run through a couple of different use cases today. Um, this is going to be a pretty quick overview because Deneen had lots of great information she wanted to share um, and didn't leave me a lot of time for the demo today. But we are more than happy to do a one-on-one -on -one demo with you afterwards. If there are specific use cases you'd like to address, we'd be really happy to dive into those with you. So to start with, I am looking at a particular customer here, um, Amber, and pulling up her details within Creatio. So perhaps I'm on the phone with Amber or she just walked in and is interacting with me at the, at the branch. Um, and I want to get a quick view of some of the key data about her. Creatio makes it really easy to customize the screen through no code drag and drop tools as Deneen has been talking about so that you can really hone in your user's attention on whatever those key facts are in their position. Um, and so that might happen through highlighting some key facts over here in this left-hand profile column. It might happen through some of these visualizations and metrics that I'm seeing at the top of my screen here, um, as well as just making sure all of the key data that they need is at their fingertips. It's really popular for our customers who are using Creatio to connect Creatio with other backend systems. So we can pull in things like, um, what are the actual account balances for all of the accounts this customer has? So we can see that data in real time or close to real time within Creatio and, and other platforms that we're using. And of course, I can click into any of these data points to see additional details. So again, this is you know very customizable, um, very much ability to you know, deliver that key data to your users so they have the information that they need to do their jobs and make good decisions.
thinking about automation in particular as the topic of this webinar today, um, one of the key flows that we hear over and over again with our customers is um, the referral process. So whether that's an automated referral, 100% automated where the system is following some rules or using AI to identify that there's an opportunity to add a new product with a customer, or whether that's uh, a user identified referral where I'm talking to Amber and she mentions that you know she needs an additional service or um, even I'm just looking at her information and I can see here that um, she's closed her savings account with us she's got a checking account but no savings account well maybe there's an opportunity there where I want to refer her over to the appropriate person to follow up on you know trying to offer her a, a deal on a, a savings account. So Creatio makes it really easy to define those processes, again, whether you know partially automated or 100% automated, um, so that you can capture the information that you need, um, create quick action buttons for your users like you just saw me use here in the system to quickly create a new referral. Um, I'm not gonna do any manual data entry on any of the information we already have in the CRM about Amber. So you know, let's not waste my time with data that's already in the system. Um, instead, I'm going to just quickly fill out a couple of key details that you know define exactly what type of product uh, Amber might be interested in. Perhaps I'm going to do some routing or perhaps the system is going to automatically route this for me to an appropriate department or a particular person to follow up on this lead um, to reach out to Amber and contact her. And, you know, maybe as I'm talking to Amber, I could just quickly ask her, you know, what's the best way to get a hold of you and track that so that the person who's receiving this referral knows the best way to, to contact Amber. Again, this entire process is extremely customizable to your exact flows. Um, this is just, you know, one example that we've seen over and over again talking to customers as one of the processes that often requires automation or could benefit from automation um, and uh, a starting point for what that might look like. Creatio has also got a really nice uh, process flow engine where you can define a series of stages or steps that a particular process needs to flow through. Um, this can be extremely high level with just a series of high level stages, or it can be extremely detailed um, with a series of steps that need to be completed within each of those stages that we're automatically prompting the user to take that next best, best, next best action. Um, or somewhere on that, you know, range in between. So it doesn't need to be uh, one end of the extremes or the other. A lot of times we're looking for something a little bit more middle of the road with some additional details for the user on what to do next, but also maybe not, you know, lockstep walking them through a particular process. And here again, there's a lot of opportunities for intelligent automation. Um, we can do things, for example, like um, if Amber does go ahead and open a savings account, we're going to know that information because we're going to pull that in from that backend system. We're going to have that record in Creatio at this point, we can automatically close out that lead as a successful sale. Um, we added that service for her. And so we don't have to rely on users to go back and close that out. You know, we don't want to rely on manual data entry, both because of the time savings factor, as well as the accuracy. Um, anything where we can automate and the system is taking care of that for us is going to be more accurate than when we're relying on a person to, to make those steps in the system. All of this data that we're capturing inside the system is of course available for us to use um, in various ways. So if I kind of step back a second, I, I started inside of Amber's contact record. Um, there's a variety of ways I might've gotten to that screen in the first place. So there's a quick search tool where you can customize different search parameters that you might wanna use like um, name and social security number or name and phone number, name and card number or account number. Um, so, you know, again, a lot of flexibility there for making it quick and easy for your team to find the right person in the system as easily but safely as possible. Um, you also have the ability to generate lists with a variety of different criteria. Um, and these are you know, easy to build out as well. So I've got, for example, a list of everyone who's got a deposit account but not a loan account. And so maybe I need to do some outreach to these people about whether they have any needs for any loans, whether that's, again, manual, you know, a call list for someone, um, or whether it's completely automated with email marketing and things like that. Um, we're going to take a look at those functions in a couple of minutes here. Um, but I did want to show you just how easy it is to manipulate and build these particular saved searches. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this one. And I'm going to switch this around. So let's say they have 
a loan account, I can type here, but they don't have a deposit account. And so I can quickly um, create that folder, that saved search, and then I can just manipulate the logic here. So rather than saying they have a deposit account, we'll say they don't have one of those. And rather than saying they don't have a loan, we'll say they do have a loan. Um, I could easily add other criteria here if I only wanted to do loans within the past 12 months or some sort of time frame, whether I only want to do loans that are currently open, um, if I want to put any other criteria in here, you know, geographic or credit score or any other data that I'm tracking in the system. And I can go ahead and quickly create that saved search. And now I can reference that list, whether again, that's for a calling campaign or an email campaign or other actions in the system. And then of course I can roll all of this data up into KPIs as well. So I can keep track of the success of my teams. I can look for anything that looks out of balance or out of whack, look for growth over time and so on and so forth. All right, the other uh, flow that I really want to talk about today in terms of process automation is a little bit on the marketing side. So again, it's a pretty popular use case that we see among our customers. Um, and Creatio does have some built-in capabilities around email marketing in particular that can be really helpful for, uh, for reaching out to people at the right time. So Creatio has got its own email designer tool and email sending tool that you can use within the, system, the application. Um, you can easily design emails using drag and drop tools. So you can make um, <laughs> say nice looking emails. I'm not a um, creative person. So Danine and I were laughing last week as we were prepping for this webinar. I, I had this grand vision in my head of making this really pretty looking email. And somehow this was the result of that vision. So that's nothing to do with the tool itself and everything to do with my lack of creativity. So try not to be too harsh on me here. Um, one of the really nice features within Creatio that I'm leveraging here is the ability to do what's called dynamic content. So you can have similar but slightly different emails for different audiences. And so I chose to use language as a parameter here in this particular message. You can do this with any data that you're tracking inside of the system. It doesn't have to be language. Um, but that is, again, a really popular example that we see here where, you know, if you have people that you know are more comfortable in a different language than English, you can send them targeted messaging in their own language rather than in English, as long as you, again, have that information on the system to, to leverage. So this is the drag and drop email designer. It's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. You can come in here and manipulate the font, the colors, the logos, the pictures. You know, what links are you going to open if someone clicks on one of these particular icons or pictures or links? Um, you can have a drag and drop library of different content um, so that you can reuse things and not have to start from scratch every time. So if I want to build something similar to this, I can just drag and drop that right into my message, replace out the pictures or the words with whatever I want to highlight in this particular example. Um, and then easily save that change so that it's ready to go out. And again, I did have that dynamic content set up in this particular example. So I've got rules in here where I can have different sections of my message um, translated into different languages again in this case, or however I want to target that content to different groups. Um, you can, of course, set out your headers, your subject line, your pre-header, which is the preview that you see. Again, these can also be dynamic, and you can preview exactly what this message is going to look like um, so that you can see what it's going to look like before it goes out. Of course, you can also send test emails to yourself or to your other test recipients um, so that you can get that in your inbox and actually see it in that context as well. And I could send this email out just one time as an email blast and get some traditional stats on that, things like opens and clicks and things like that. But I can also take these emails and put them together into a campaign. This allows me to get a little bit more strategic um, about what I'm trying to accomplish and, and chain together a series of steps. And again, there's a drag and drop tool here for building these campaigns, for designing what those steps need to look like. So you've got the ability to put together a variety of different steps. Um, that's going to include things like, of course, sending out emails. So I've got a couple of emails here in this particular campaign. Um, you can track um, 
participation in web forms landing pages. So not only did they click the link to go to my landing page, but did they actually submit that form? I can send them to different steps based on that behavior. So did they click the email link or did they not? Did they fill out the landing page form or did they not? Um, and I'm not only limited to email actions, I can do other actions as well. Um, so for example, here I put in a couple of activities to have various teams, you know, go into a calling campaign um, for these particular recipients so that um, we're following up if they didn't respond to that email activity, maybe they'll respond better through another channel. We'll just try reaching out to them by phone and see if that has any better success. Um, you've got the ability to test different actions against each other. So I've got a split in here to try this action versus that action. I can measure the success relative of this versus that. Um, and of course, you've got you know other activities or other steps you can take, um, as well as the ability, of course, to define who your audience is. So this could be um, using those particular already saved searches. In this case, I'm using a saved search here that I've already got created or it can be defined directly inside of the campaign tool where I'm just building the logic that I need here um, directly inside of my campaign engine. And again, all of this data, all of this information is going to be tracked. You're gonna be capturing data on where particular contacts are as they move through this campaign. Um, these could be things that you do as a one-time campaign, like in this example, you know, interest rates are rising. This is perhaps pretty timely right now. Um, maybe this is a short-term thing that I want to do. I could also have automated campaigns that whenever there's an, um, a referral created for a checking account, you know, start sending this particular sequence of emails or start this particular sequence of steps so that we're automatically following that process. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and pause here. Um, Deneen has a couple of things she wants to share to wrap up before the top of the hour here today. And I also wanna allow time if there were any questions since I haven't been checking the, the chat area during that demo. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to pop them into the chat. Or as I mentioned, Sam will be following up with you too, um, just to see if there's any outstanding things that we can help you with after this presentation. Um, I wanna thank Megan uh, for her, like she said, very quick, because I didn't give her a lot of time, but she nailed it. Um, <laughs> just trying to give you an overview of the types of things that you can do in a no-code process automation tool like Creatio. Um, I'm going to follow up with you with the content of this webinar. I know we covered a lot of information. If you want to go back and reference any of it, I will break that apart for you into different sub-videos so that you can uh, go back and, and re- re-familiarize yourself with some of the data that we covered. Um, and so you can expect that email from me, uh, hopefully in the next 24 hours. That's going to be my priority for this afternoon. Um, so I just want to thank you for your attention today. And as Megan said, she covered this very high level, but um, if you would like to see any of this in more detail, um, you can reach out to any of us at the email addresses provided here. And uh, you could also just reply to the email I send you. I will receive that. Um, so uh, there are multiple outlets and ways that you can reach out to us. And uh, hopefully we can help you out. So thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day and appreciate everybody's attention on our discussion today. I hope it brought you some value.